am so pleased to welcome to the podcast Dr. Atul Grover, Executive Director of the Association of American Colleges Research and Action Institute. I bet you have a very long business card. Uh, and I want to offer him a public apology for not having him on sooner. Atul is the co-author of the report we talked about on last week's episode on how graduating medical students are less likely to apply for residency in states with abortion bans and restrictions. Welcome at last to What the Health. Better late than never. (laughs) So there seems to be some confusion, at least in social media land, about some of the numbers here. Tell us what your analysis found. First, Julie, is there ever not confusion in social media land? Uh, So the numbers basically bear out the same thing that we saw last year, making it a very short but real trend, which is that when we look at where new U.S. medical school graduates are applying for residencies, and they apply to any number of programs, What they're doing, it appears, is selectively avoiding those states in which abortion is either completely banned or severely restricted. And that's not just in reproductive health heavy specialties like OBGYN, but it seems to be across the board. Now, can you explain why all of the numbers seem to be going down? Uh, It's not that the number of applicants are falling, right? It's number of applications. Yeah. So, you know, there's about 20,000 people that graduate from U.S. MD schools every year. There are another 15 to 20,000 applicants for residency positions that are DO graduates domestically or international graduates, could be U.S. citizens or or foreign uh, citizens. But what we've tried to do for a number of years is encourage applicants to apply to a fewer number of residency programs because we found that they were sort of out out applying. You know, they were over applying where we did some some data uh, analyses a couple of years back on diminishing returns where we said, look, once you apply to 15, 20, 30 programs, your likelihood of matching, I know you're nervous, but the likelihood of matching is not going to go up. You're going to do fine. You don't need to apply to 60, 70, 80 programs. So the good news is we're actually seeing those numbers come down by about, for U.S. medical grads, about 7% this year, which is really the first time that I can remember in the last 10 years that this has happened. So that is good news. Now, And that was an explicit goal. That was an explicit goal. We want to make this cheaper easier and more rational for applicants and for programs as they have to screen people and figure out who really wants to come to their program. So overall, we were really pleased to see that the average applicant, as they applied to programs, applied to a few uh, less programs, which meant that in many cases, they were maybe not applying to one or two states that the average applicant might have applied to last year. So on average, each state saw about a 10% decrease in the number of unique applicants. But that decrease was much higher when we looked at those states that had banned abortion or severely limited it. So eventually, all these residency positions fill, though, right? Because there are more applicants, as you point out, more more graduating medical students and incoming medical students and incoming graduates from other countries than there are slots. So why should we care if all of these programs are filling? So I think you should always care about the number of residency spots. And I know you have a long history here, as do I, in that that is the bottleneck where we have to deal with why we have physician shortages or one of the reasons why across the board. We just don't train enough physicians. We have increased the number of medical school spots. We have people that are are graduating from DO schools, as I said, international graduates. More are applying every year than we have space for, which means that, yes, right now, every spot will fill because if the alternative for somebody applying is, look, I either won't get in and actually be able to train in my specialty of choice, or I may have to go to my third choice or 10th choice or 50th choice or 100th choice. I'd rather go to some place than no place at all. So yes, everything is filling, but our look at the USMD seniors was in part because we believe that they are the most competitive applicants and and in some ways the most desirable applicants. They have like a 95% success in the match year after year. And so we thought they would be the most sensitive to look at in terms of, hey, I've got a little more choice here. Maybe I won't apply to that state where I don't feel I I can practice medicine freely for my patients. And I think that's a potential problem for a lot of these states and a lot of these programs is 
if the people who might have been applying if the laws were different, who happen to be a better match for your program, for your specialty and your community, aren't choosing to apply there, yes, you can fill it, but maybe not with the ideal candidate. And, and I think that's going to affect patients and populations and local communities uh, in the years to come. Now, when we saw the beginning of this trend last year, most of the talk was about a potential shortage of OBGYNs going forward um, since physicians often stay and practice where it is that they do their residency. But now, as you mentioned, we're seeing a decrease in applications and specialties across the board. Why would that be? So this is um, an informed opinion as to why people across specialties are choosing not to apply to residencies in these states. We didn't ask the specific people who are matching this past year, why did you choose to apply or not to apply to this state? So what we know, though, from asking questions in other surveys is that about 70% of all health professions uh, and health profession students believe that abortion should be legal at some point during a pregnancy. If you look at some specialties like adolescent medicine, that number goes up to 96%. So number one, I think it's a potential violation of what people believe should be some freedom between doctors and patients as to allowing them to have the full range of reproductive health care. Number two, I think the potential penalties and the laws are often viewed as being incredibly um, punitive and somewhat unclear. And as much as doctors hate getting sued, we really don't want to be indicted. I know some people are fine getting indicted. We really don't want to be indicted. And that has implications because if we're indicted, if we're convicted of any kind of criminal offense, we could lose our license and not be able to care for patients. And, and we have a long investment in trying to do so. The third thing that I think is relevant is certainly some of the specialties we're looking at are um, heavily uh, populated by women physicians, so OBGYN, pediatrics. But again, across the board, it's 50% it's women. So I think... For the women themselves that happen to be applying, there is this issue of, think about their ages, 26, 27, 28 to the mid-30s, for the most part. And there, there are outliers on either end. But for the most part, they are of reproductive age. And I think they want to have control over their own lives and their own health care and make sure that all services are available to them and their families if they need it. And I think even if it's not relevant to you as an individual, it probably is relevant to your spouse or, or partner or somebody else in your family. And I think that makes a huge difference when people make these choices. So in the end, assuming this, these trends continue, I mean, there really is concern for what the health professional community will look like in some of these states, right? Yeah. And I think, you know, one of the things that um, I tried to look at last year in an editorial for JAMA was trying to overlay the states that have already significant challenges in recruiting and retaining physicians. They tend to be a lot of the heavily rural states, southern states, uh, parts of the Midwest. You overlay that on a map of the 14 states now that have basically banned abortion, and there's a pretty close match. So I, I think it's critically important for state, local officials, legislatures, governors to think about their own potential impact of passing these laws on something that they may think is critically important, which is recruiting and retaining health professionals. And as you said, about half of people who train in a state will end up staying there to practice. And for these pipeline programs, I know places like Mississippi and Alabama will really try and recruit uh, individuals from underserved communities, get them through high school, get them into college, get them to stay in the state for med school, stay in the state for residency, they're 80% likely to stay in those states. You lose them at any point along the way, and they're a lot less likely to come back. So uh, without even telling these states, like, I can't tell you what's good for you, but you should at least figure out how to collect the data at a local level to understand the implications of your policies on the health of everybody in a state, not just women of reproductive age. And I assume that we'll be hearing more about this and I, I would think asking, so. yes. asking more students about it. Yes, we will. And, and we uh, get to administer something called the graduation questionnaire every year um, for all these MD students. One of the questions we just added, and hopefully we'll have some data, my colleagues will have that by probably August or so, is asking them specifically, 
what role did laws around some of these social issues have in your choice of where to do your residency? And again, there's some overlap here of states that have restricted reproductive rights, transgender care, and some other issues that are probably all kind of mixed in. Great. We'll have you back to talk about it then. Great. And I'm happy to come back and talk about market consolidation, about life expectancy, the quality of U.S. health care, or anything else you want. Atul Grover, thank you so much. Thanks for having me.